So, um, so let's get started. I thought I'll just do a quick speaker's profile. Um, we, I will, when, when I name the speaker, can the speaker just raise your hand so that um, everyone can see who you are? And then I will just say a little, share a little bit about you. Okay, so Tan Yifen. Can everyone see Tan Yifen? Now, Tan Yifen is the Leadership Development Manager at uh, Teach uh, for Malaysia. Everyone knows, and I'm sure everyone's heard of Teach for Malaysia. She's an alumnus of Teach for Malaysia for Malaysia's 2013 cohort, and through which she taught history and English in secondary schools in Perak. Now, her grassroots experiences in classrooms, schools, and local communities in various settings have allowed her to gain deeper understanding of the beauty and possibilities of individuals and communities for the betterment of the nation, as well as some understanding of the existing challenges in society that limit students and local community members from realizing that full potential. Welcome, Ethan. Welcome. Now, uh, going on to Chong Wai Ling. Hi, Wailing. Hello. Wailing Hi. is a music teacher and a creative uh, writing coach and an author. She's an advocate for home education in Malaysia. She has a large following, let me tell you that. Okay. And together with her husband, uh, KV Soon, who's also in the room with us today, they run a website called Learning Beyond Schooling to share their ideas and learning strategies that are creative and future proof. That's why you're here today. Huh? Mm -hmm. um, they have three well-rounded children. Uh, we understand from Wailing, two of them are basking as we speak, uh, mm -hmm. performing somewhere. Now, all three children are products of unschooling. Now, she'll tell us about that. Her book, Learning Beyond Schooling, has inspired many parents to embark on the path of interest-led learning. Welcome, Wailing. Thank you, thank you. Now, um, let me introduce Gregory Chong. Greg is a highly sought after corporate and wedding um, videographer. Uh, Greg's uh, camera is not working today, but you've got this nice snapshot, cool snapshot of him with, with uh, all suited for the event. Uh, he specializes in capturing moments and turning them into a lifetime of memories. He's also active in grassroots community building initiatives engaging local communities to become agents of change in their own neighborhood. Um, Greg is a fully engaged father of four and he has got a set of twin girls. Now together with his wife, Elsfi, they run a homeschooling enrichment center of learning for preschoolers called Mind of Gems. Welcome Greg and thank Hello, you for welcome. joining us thank and also kindly hosting some of the technical bits. Um, welcome to Lily, Lily Maria. Hi, Lily. Welcome. Lily is a passionate educator with an extensive education experience close to 20 years. Lily has worked with a few high schools in the UK and local uh, Malaysian government and private secondary schools. She's, she was also a principal for more than five years and has held positions as an academic director and education consultant before becoming the deputy principal in a leading private school in Malaysia. She also comes in with her specialization in innovation, virtual education, which is so timely now, Lily, and her and professional education and teaching. So welcome, Lily. Now, welcome to uh, all our audience who have joined us. Let me see the numbers. We have 42 people in the room. Not too bad. Your first question. So what is, uh, starting with Ethan, so what is your learning from the pandemic? Ethan, and how has it shaped your personal view of the future and the evolution of society? Now, the same question will be for all as well, yeah? Okay, yeah. go ahead, Ethan. So, um, coming from Teach for Malaysia perspective, and I think there are three key learnings that we have learned uh, during um, the past few months. Uh, one key element is on um, equitable educations where no child should be left behind. So, um, and we know there has been a key priorities and a need for our public health systems and uh, the national, national security councils um, to manage the, the effects of the pandemics. But when there is a decline in education, and this will also bring a significant imp impact um, on fundamental long-term nation-building outcomes, such as the social well-being, reducing in 
in equalities, elevating talent competitiveness compet competitiveness and social cohesions. So, um, given that um, Teach for Malaysia serve uh, in uh, students coming from a low income communities and rural areas, so this is especially very very true. Uh, prior to MCOs, uh, the students are already not receiving the level of supports they need uh, based on what I've personally observed from, uh, from teachers that I'm supporting. And, and in the presence of a uh, pandemic, and the gap of the supports of the students are even wider, uh, much more evident. And, and the second key point that we have also learned is collaborations is very, very needed. Um, Every member in this society, uh, this whole ecosystem actually needs to work together. Um, so, um, and the people involved should not be just uh, parents and teachers, but what we, we really appreciate is like private companies, businesses, non-governmental uh, agencies should also come together. I think at the first phase, there's definitely an effort needs to be diverted into public health initiative. But once the, the effects of pandemics are well managed, uh, the focus should come back to education for the nation building efforts. Um, and the third elements that we learned, it's uh, the opportunities uh, given to us to reimagine education. Okay, all right. Uh, thank you, thank you. Um, and um, can I just now invite uh, Wiley to share your views and then later I will just sum up a little bit. Yeah, um, to I'm total in total agreement that um, the, those, the whole, a whole group of uh, uh, children have not been able to uh, get the education that they're much needed, right? And uh, for most of the rest, that is mainly uh, middle class, uh, children, they are fine because they have everything. Yeah. So the 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 key areas I I have learned from the pandemic is that number one, we are indeed ill prepared for any emergencies. This is one of the the first major major one that we are facing. Okay. So on the 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 government side, it's like it's like a shock. Right, that, but luckily in Malaysia we have a lot of uh, NGOs and a lot of uh, communities that uh, put in. So it, it helps a great deal. Number two, the, our teachers in schools, you know, um, especially in government schools, they're not prepared for this. When the, for the private and international schools, they have been actually doing a lot of uh, online teaching. So the switch was quite easy, but we, we can see that a lot of schools, the teachers and the students are struggling. Yeah, but it took them many, many weeks before they, they managed to climb on board. Number three is uh, because over the decades, students have been very much spoon fed in schools, that this suddenly they are, left in a lurch and uh, no, no teacher to instruct them, you know, so they are lost and they don't, you know, they don't know what to do at home. Yeah, so that is the one thing. So they definitely need to change this approach um, to something that is more self-directed, right? Then number four is that parents also have been very much uninvolved you know, normally they're uninvolved in the school. So it's like school is the school and then just make sure they do their homework, but not really getting enough love. So this period of the, the lockdown for so many weeks and parents uh, have, to, have to get involved and actually learn what the students are learning. So these are the things that get, have, to, have to wake us up into this slumber. Actually, these are uh, already been um, forecasted when, you know, um, Malaysia got into the knowledge economy, 
and uh, MSC was launched 20 years ago by Dr. Mahadeo, and we were actually invited as homeschoolers also uh, to a lot of uh, seminars, and we are talking about knowledge economy and how the content creators, but we didn't change anything in the way that we teach the children, you know, we educate the children in schools. And so that like fizzled out. It actually literally fizzled out. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So yeah, that is really, really sad. Yeah. Okay. So right. anyways, so these are the points. Good, good. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, just very quickly, um, I'll just say you're saying, both of you are saying children are left out of the system, that we're not quite prepared for what the pandemic threw before us. And uh, I think Ethan also talked about the gaps that were already there that we knew in terms of the education and Wiling touched on that. And this is surfaced, right? The inequalities, access. Um, and then you spoke about the approach to self-directed learning, which really needs to be, come back. And, you know, so what is being taught and where is the learning taking place? And education, as we know, is not limited only to the children who go to school or people who are in school systems. Um, we know from UNESCO that 1.5 billion people are out of school, out of learning uh, ac academies. And this is not including refugees or homeschooling uh, the population. It also doesn't include adults who are also in learning facilities. So education, we'd like to look at in a broad sense, yeah? Uh, and also parental involvement. Now, let me call on uh, Gregory to uh, give us uh, his insights on, on that question about, I'll say the, read the question again, what's your learning from the pandemic and how has it shaped your personal view of the future and evolution of society and welcome real Gregory not photograph very good nice okay yeah so I I'm uh, because my laptop uh, my MacBook uh, suddenly the the camera just couldn't work and then now I'm on my phone can you hear me yes yes loud and clear okay so uh, yeah I have to be frank I haven't seen the question prior to this um, um, webinar I, I just listening to the question now uh, that's how bu how busy I am, uh, because uh, what happened is this during this pandemic or this uh, lockdown. Um, I think what I've learned is that I've found I found I found out that my two uh, twin girls uh, they are six years old. Uh, kindergarten they went they go to kindergarten and found out that they actually do not know a lot of things. They haven't learned a lot of things. Because I think for, for a parent like me, we, we always uh, take things for granted. We, or I mean, not we, my, my, myself, maybe I just, I took things for granted and um, I just left the education to the school and left uh, uh, to, to the kindergarten, uh, I mean, the education of my child to the school or to the kindergarten. So I thought that they are learning a lot of things. But this lockdown, I found out that they actually do not know a lot of things and they haven't learned a lot of things. So, and true enough, uh, a lot of, my daughter's classmates, also, their parents also have also raised the same uh, uh, concern that they've just found out that the children actually do not know how to read, do not know how, how uh, basic mathematics and all. So, and, um, and then um, this pandemic has also really, uh, as a parent, I also felt that um, uh, what, what I've seen uh, in the society, whatever is happening in the, in the world, has also told me as a parent that um, that the education system that has been there uh, in the our in in the current situation or the current system now is actually not working. To me, I feel is the education system is broken, and uh, it is because of the education system that has been broken or is is broken for the past twenty to fifty years. And this is the results that that the result is whatever is happening in the world now. This is the result. Uh, looking at what happening, what happened in uh, in the U.S. and uh, what happened in Hong Kong and places around and in Malaysia as well, you know, with regards to uh, racism and all. So I felt that uh, really we have to really rethink of education and we have to redesign, reinvent education altogether. Okay. Thank you, Greg. Thanks. Um, that, that's that's powerful because you're talking about social issues and uh, how somehow all of us from many, many years have been products of a so-called education system. 
and we find generality how the inequalities and social issues have already surfaced and it's quite scary. Uh, thanks for sharing that uh, from a parent's perspective. Uh, now Lily, can I invite you to uh, share your, your thoughts? Right. Good afternoon, everyone. Okay, based on, uh, okay, the question, what is your learning from the pandemic and how has it shaped your personal view? All right, a little bit of the back background information. Schools were actually to, uh, thrown into a lurch around early March. I think they, they announced, the government announced the MCO during the school days. I remember we were still doing extra classes and we were only given two days. Uh, schools were required to actually conduct classes. Being a for-profit school, we actually had to rush everything. Our teachers actually had to migrate fully to online classes, uh, uh, I think two weeks after. And uh, based on my observation and my experience with my teachers and all, three things can be uh, grouped together. I will make it into an acronym. One is uh, it's just basically CIA, all right? C for collaborative effort, collective conscious coherence, and common good. Whatever endeavor that we uh, wish to undertake in such times of crisis, we need collaboration. It is not a one-man show. We need people to help out. We need everyone to be on board. So this collective conscious uh, uh, coherence, once everyone knows, in my teachers, for example, teachers especially, they were just given the uh, directions what to do. Okay, you're supposed to teach online, but how? And in that sense, uh, teaching them how to go about hey, comes, go the rise, hello, comes the rise of uh, servant leadership. We have leaders, transformational leaders. I mean, uh, literature has actually defined many types of leadership, but in times of uh, a crisis, such as this pandemic, servant leadership comes up. That's where the leaders of a community, leaders of an organization, leaders of the group, any group, leaders of the family, heads of families, need to start listening, show empathy, uh, progress towards making healing uh, uh, possible, conceptualize plans, have some foresight, for example, okay, next week, uh, MCO is still on. What are we going to do about it? Supplies. In the school's perspective, okay, how are we going to revise our schemes of work? Students are not coming to, to, to the online classes. They're very selective in their attendance. How are we going to go about that? And most importantly, developing your own crew, your own teammates. That's the C part, right? Collaboration and common good. The I would be the immediacy. Immediacy of response and immediacy to respond. We can see that with our government as well. It happens to all forms of organization as well as units and groups. Immediacy of response means for me, give solutions. We already have problems and problems will keep propping up as we go along. But if you do not propose solutions, then people will be uh, in a lot of doubt and that is not good. And immediacy to respond, I mean, since we are for-profit school, our stakeholders, they need feedback, they need information. So if you have the chance, I mean, even for us, we are always waiting for news and updates. Every day we'll go and search. I mean, they did a poll. Uh, Malaysians were checking on the start, COVID-19, COVID-19 uh, cases, new cases. Why do we have that trend? It's because we, we are people, we need information before we, we, we plan to do something else, we need that information so that we can plan further ahead, all right? And the A in the CIA is access to information. Like I've just said, access to information is for collective good, whether it's for the society, the organization, the group, the family, the school, for example, and even for the individual. So in the access to information, we can see we need to have the develop the ability to discern right or wrong information. And based uh, after you have discerned whether the information is correct or valid, we have to start making action plans judiciously. All right. Um, how it, this has shaped my perception of the future and evolution of society, it has actually reinforced my belief that we live in a VUCA world. This is a very military term 
VUCA, V-U-C-A, V for volatile, U for uncertain, C for complex because of the many variables and interconnected elements that can create, uh, create chaos and confusion. In this, in this particular case, the pandemic. And A for ambiguous. And what I learned is the future, whether it's near or far, long or short, is very fluid. So we will have disruptions. And these disruptions can come in the form of good or bad to the society, or positive or negative. Whether, the disrupt, uh, whether it's good or bad, it's a material, it will disrupt the ex uh, existing system that we have, the existing structures, as well as our existing practices. Thank you. And once that happens, it shakes the status quo and we have to reevaluate our own norms. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Thank you so much. So uh, very, very good uh, take home uh, in terms of your CIA. I love collaboration for the common good. And I think, and also service um, or servant leadership. And this is something I think we're thinking about everyone, right? And the pandemic has really, really, like I said, brought brought to the fore a lot of the inequalities. And, you know, even in the government and civil society spaces, we're thinking about what what should we uh, pick up from our learning from the pandemic that will help us rewrite this future? And uh, thank you for sharing some of those uh, points. Let me move on to the next, um, next uh, question. And um, again, do your best. I know you're trying your best. Let's keep to the three minutes, yeah? Um, how can education, and this time maybe I will ask uh, Wiling to go first. How can education be an agent of change in the new normal? And what change do you want to see? Now let's look at education in the broader sense. I know just now we spoke about all the issues of uh, school and things like that, but then let's look at education in the broader sense for humanity. What, what, what can education in general terms be and how can it be an agent of change in the new normal as we rewrite our future? And what kind of change do you want to see? Go ahead. Now, when we talk about education, a lot of people, uh, I'm not all, not all, but majority, think of um, having a, a good career, a good job, well-paying job, you know, and, and, and for a more certain future. But as we can see with this pandemic, that there is nothing certain anymore. And we cannot predict what's going to happen even today or tomorrow. Yeah. So, but we have the scientists and all have already um, done, their, done their part and already warning us about the environment and all. Yeah. But it's, most of it is not heated. So what I feel the education, what kind of education we need is education starting from the heart. You need to start from there. We cannot constantly look externally for all the answers to all our problems because all these problems created by men by our selfishness, our greed, our ignorance, our delusion. So that, that, that sounds like, wow, how are you going to do that? So it starts from the family, you know? So because we have children, because we were children before, you know, we, we need to take it as growing a plant, you know? You need the nutrients, you need to water them. So you need to feed them with the right values and that will guide them when they grow into a stronger plant and then they will spread wide, far and wide. Yeah. So it sounds like, oh, so idealistic. We're not going to be able to. I can tell you that there are many, many people who have opted, families who have opted to reclaim their education, not to outsource entirely to outside to the institution we have seen the change the change is very very significant like from this pandemic every, all the schools children have been affected but 
those who have been learning from home, have been self-directed in their learning, we have been very much shielded from all the chaos of, oh, what to do, where to get everything. No, we've been doing it all our lives. We've been, I've been uh, in a home educating the children since I think about 20 years already. My, my girls are already adults. Yeah. And not just me, but many, many. Right. So this is proof that when we take care of our children from the beginning and we continue to take care, how their attitude towards learning is not for exams. It's because we want to improve ourselves because we're genuinely interested to learn. Yeah. And, and uh, when we talk to students, uh, when we, uh, I teach a lot of school going kids, you know, and then I talk to them about that. They look at me blankly. So what are you talking about? You know, we have to just follow what's been given to us. So I, I tell them you have to take ownership of your learning, right? For, for example, in the music, they're learning some music. And I said, you, are you just learning for the exam? You know, there's so much more things to discover. And then it's like mind boggling to them. But those who have followed me, they understand and they are doing in-depth study and all. So that is the education that can really change. Yeah. 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 And we can all do that as communities work together. Amazing, amazing. What you have just shared is starting from the individual, the family, you are speaking about a whole of society approach in, yes. in education belongs to everyone, right? Yes. You said they should start from the heart and from the family. It should be values based. You're saying that you have seen that people have opted to reclaim the education of their children. And I think the pandemic has thrown all parents uh, yes, they are juggling with the different roles of working and, and, uh, and seeing their children through education. But I agree with you, we can see the change is significant. The parents, what Gregory was saying earlier about the parents realizing how much or how little the children know. Uh, and, and you can see the glaring uh, gaps as well. Um, and then I love what you said about taking ownership of their learning and how, that, how important that is. That's for all of us. Yeah, so again, we are looking at education in the broader sense. Very good. Thank you for that. Uh, Yifen, how would you take that question, Yifen? So um, one key part is of um, TFM, it's we, um, we advocates to, to reimagine like how does excellent education look like in a new normal. And, and we thought of three, three kind of uh, areas. One is on focusing on holistic and 21st century learning. And I think uh, some of the uh, guest speakers today have brought out some important points about like, for example, self-directed learnings that is needed in students. And second, it's um, KFM is also advocating for shift away from a singular focus on high stakes examinations. And the third one is how can we use technology in a transformational ways? So when we that deep into deeper of like uh, how how does this call um, principles um, turn into practices and and what we wanted to see the changes in our students or uh, the or the communities who work together um, um, to to educate our younger generations is we want our students to be engaged meaningfully and what it meant by this it's um, one, uh, students' uh, social emotional, emotional skills need to be developed. Um, second, we need to also understand what works for the students. Third, clarifying our assumptions. I think in this society, we, we function a lot based on our assumptions and not necessarily the fact. Uh, fourth, empowering students to reflect on and articulate their learning. And the fifth one is the collaborations with the communities. Mm -hmm. So, um, and, and we have seen these examples of how uh, these principles have come into life during, uh, during this pandemic seasons uh, in, in our teachers. Um, so for example, we know that our students are, are this is also a very, pandemic is also a very new experience to our students. And, and in a home environment, 
parents may not be equipped to uh, help our students to articulate their emotions and teach them how to process that. So, um, so one of our teachers, uh, what she has done is to teach students on um, a vocabularies, uh, a list of vocabularies on emotional words, uh, using map fillings to picture, uh, map fillings to the pictures uh, as one of the energizer activities for our students when they conduct um, online classes. And uh, when thinking of examples such as, let me think, um, asking students what works for them. And teachers take that initiative to reach out to the students and running pools of uh, which type of platforms work for the students. I think it's, it's important, especially for low-income students, uh, understandings like what kind of access they have, um, which platform actually is feasible to the type of access. Because some platforms require more bandwidth and some require lower. And when students have just, do just have phone with them and mobile data, and uh, most of the times the options is going to uh, low bandwidth options or sometimes got to be even offline uh, options to help them to, to learn. Yeah. yeah. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you. Um, yeah, there's, there's a lot of talk on 21st century learning, right? I mean, since the beginning of the century. Um, and I like that it's very self-directed, which really uh, resonates with Wiling and, and many of us here that we shift from exams. And I think uh, locally as well, they're, they're starting to look at that, exploring that. Um, and then the use of technology and now more than ever before. Uh, we see that uh, I work with some communities in Sarawak where the children because they live in the slums, they have not had education at all, any form of instruction at all for the past few months, uh, just because there's no technology, right? Uh, I like that the, you talked about engaging meaningfully um, and uh, clarifying our assumptions about what we think we know. And also the other very important point you made about reflecting on learning. And I think we don't do that enough, but I think this pause pause, humanity, pause, this period of pause that we've had, humanity has been able to reflect. And we ha if we haven't, during the RMCO, let's do that. And today's discourse is to, uh, session is to uh, help us with that as well. So uh, Lily, what is your take on the question, Lily? Can you unmute Lily? Thank you. Okay. Uh, well, there's a reason why in the, in the course of history, when there is any aggressive events like war and revolution, teachers are always the first to be, to be uh, taken hostage or shot. But uh, to correct the mindset, we are all teachers and we are all students. But the question here is, the pertinent question here is, are we lifelong teachers and are we lifelong learners? So this is something that is very lacking in our society these days. Uh, once a lot of people, once they think they've graduated from, from university, they've, they've gotten their job, that's it. Yes, I'm not going to teach anyone. I'm not going to learn anything. Be, uh, I'm going to learn. I'm, I'm just going to access information that is interesting to me, but may not be beneficial to me, like uh, what Kardashian wore last week. But um, in a very non-standard definition of a teacher, which is the whole member's every member of society, what we need to do is, I think we need to develop and cultivate new mindsets. The current existing mindset that a child needs to take to get a degree, uh, to be able to ascend higher in society and to get a good job should stop. There are skill sets that do not require degrees and also attainments of uh, examination, the results and all, is not, I mean, it does not encapsulate uh, really encapsulate what the child or the student is. The capabilities, the aptitudes, as well as uh, what they can actually do and contribute to society. That must change. And also the change in expectations, as well as priorities. Uh, School-wise, curriculum needs to be revamped. Content must be re made relevant. You don't need to teach so much content that is already outdated. We have Google and Siri for, for that. Students now can just access information at their fingertips. But it's the, man, the manner of which, how they apply the information that they gain. 
how they process it, how they apply it to real life, how they innovate, how they evaluate, and how they create based on the knowledge that they have. These are the, the, the important things that we have to, to, to think about. Our current school system, sadly, is still modeled after Industrial Revolution model, Industrial Revolution 1. We are already way past it. And our new generation have different uh, needs. They are digital natives and we are falling behind. Uh, this pandemic, actually, when we all went fully online, you can see that the, the students can actually become autonomous learners. And they are actually very creative. The, the challenge will be the lower uh, age ranges, the kindergartners, because they may need a lot of parental engagement. That's where it comes in as well. So parents could not just be like, you know, either two helicopter or just hands off. It has to be a balance in terms of parental engagement in what their children do in school. Okay, I think that's basically that. And um, I, I just want to, uh, before I end, the, if you know Pink Floyd, Brick in the Wall, they've always, um, in the video, it showed the school as a meat grinder. Different children go into the school and come out as slabs of meat. That should stop. We should actually create and celebrate the individual and not the collective in that sense. Because these individuals can actually contribute significantly and uniquely to the collective and to the society. Yeah, amazing. Very good, very good. Um, it's so exciting how it's coming along, some of these thoughts and ideas and the alignment of uh, all our speakers as well. I like what you talked about, um, that the, the focus on changing mindsets. And um, yes, and, and, and in doing so, how the uh, curriculum needs to be and the method in which we teach and how does learning take place and how do we even define uh, the individuals that come out of an education system? Is that piece of paper enough? Are those the skill sets that are enough? Um, and also to recognize the capacity of children the importance of parental engagement and uh, to be able to um, create and celebrate the individual. So again, we're coming back to the individual that needs to go out. Um, very, very, and, and beyond looking at it as a factory line. Uh, amazing uh, input. I just want to also bring attention to the group chat um, that, the, that people are just on the go, they're on the roll. There's a lot being said, and I don't think I'll be able to capture everything. But once in a while, please shift your eyes to the group chat and 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 uh, get it and uh, contribute there as well as respond to your fellow audience members as well. Okay, uh, let's hear from the parent, Greg. What is your take on the question of how can education be an agent of change in the new normal, and what change do you, as a parent, want to see? Greg, go ahead. As a parent, can't hear you, Greg. Not can't hear me. Do you hear me now? Uh, a bit louder, please. Can you hear me? Uh, everyone, okay. Uh, it's a bit soft for me, but go ahead. Just now is okay. That sounds better. Go ahead. Okay. Can you hear me now? Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, I'm gonna... okay, if you stop 30 seconds of your time, <laughs> but go, okay, ahead. go ahead. So, <laughs> how can education be the agent of change in this new normal? To me, I feel that uh, every one of us should um, imagine what kind of future do you want for your kids first? What kind of future do you want? What kind of the world that you want or you imagine that you would like to have for your children? Is this the current, is this the current world that you want? for your children. The, the current world that is filled with greed, current world that is filled with uh, corruption, uh, that is totally uh, selfish with regards how the way, I mean, filled with a lot of racism. Is this the kind of future that we want for our children? So imagine the kind of future that we want that is harmonious, that people can help each other during pandemic, that we are, you know, I mean, uh, the panelists are saying that work from the heart, people that is good-hearted, people that can share, there is no corruption, uh, it is fair, there is justice. 
if we want to see this kind of world or the future for our children, so we have to work back, backwards from there. Mm -hmm. As you know, the, the current education that we have already now is already showing proven to you that it's not working. And this, this chaos, you know, look, the, the chaos, if, if the education followed a set of, um, a set of uh, principles, we would have uh, easily tackled this pandemic and uh, quickly, and everybody would be happy. But look at the situation right now. So to me, I feel that as how education can be the change is to work backwards. So we have to use innovative methods to be able to produce citizens that is intellectual, spiritual, and so that they have high moral standards so that you are, you are able to see that uh, when I, I started to be a, a teacher during this pandemic uh, because uh, you know the kindergarten of my children stopped and many parents withdraw their kids and then I started to do online uh, teaching as a volunteer and I, I felt that um, really the children one of my online sessions uh, when I was talking about Pasar um, Malam um, you know, they were, they were totally that brown skin people are bad. You know, you are, there are a lot of virus there. So really, the children are being taught from their parents. So parents have to learn first because parents are the first teacher to their kids. So I, t I, I try to teach them uh, a lot of uh, human values so that because they are the future. You see. And I feel that how education can be the agent of change is that uh, the whole entire world should actually have a unifying framework, sets of framework that, that, uh, that is based on human rights and that is based on diversity of, of, um, of uh, human so that in the future, the new generation of society, they are able to work together as a oneness of humanity as from the principle of the oneness of humanity and I felt I feel that education can be the change if education is being reinvent to address both spiritually and also the academics not just to learn to be uh, to find a good job find high high pay job but behind you do a lot of um, uh, you you know you you, you can uh, have a big factory but you are you know, burning a lot of uh, uh, bad uh, gases on the, in, in the air and all sorts of things. Yeah. Because if your human values is not there, no matter how good you are, no matter how intelligent you are, there is, there is no change or you can't be the agent of change in this society. Mm -hmm. And I feel that education must directly address the inner life and the character of the individuals. The children needs to know what is their purpose in their life. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, very interesting. I mean, you see, you're seeing, uh, this, is, this is the reflection of parents, you know. Uh, Greg, I loved what you said about looking at the, uh, considering the kind of future that we want. And I think these are conversations around a dinner table with the children, right? Everyone's under lockdown. So what kind of future are we looking at even as a family? And what is the current, what, what kind of a world do we want to shape and who shapes that? And to work backwards from there, even as a family in terms of consultation and deciding what, how the family will move forward, I think this is a great uh, way to look at it. And you are saying that now is that moment really to recalibrate, right? And how we use innovation uh, to produce that uh, individual um, that has high moral standards and serve the common good. And you also talked about how parents are the first teachers of their children. And we need a universal framework for education based on the oneness of humanity, that principle of the oneness of humanity. Um, I like that you mentioned that education should consider the spiritual, and some people may say the moral compass, the spiritual aspects and the academic aspects and not just academic focuses only. And I think the icing on the cake was when you said that we need to consider the inner life and character of an individual. At the end of the day, that's what makes or breaks a society. And everything of what you said made me think 
uh, about uh, when, when someone passes away and at their funeral service, when someone presents a eulogy, nobody talks about how many cars you have or how many houses you have. Everyone talks about the kind of person uh, he or she is. And I think that that is in a way our, our compass and indicator to consider. Now, again, a lot going on in the chat box. Please look there. In the interest of time, I may not be able to touch on it. I'd like to open it to the audience um, to give specific questions, but otherwise, please have a be distracted. That's what I'm saying. Be distracted and pop into the chat box, as I know some of you have done. Let me move on to the last question. In a way, you're summing up your thoughts, because I think all of you have covered everything. Uh, the last question is that it takes a village to raise a child right? How many times have we heard this being said so much so that has it become cliche or is it appearing true now than ever before? So what are some constructive ways? Now, this is where we end our session with very specific uh, lines of actions, maybe three critical things or so. What are some constructive ways that we as protagonists, when I say protagonists, every man, woman, youth and child, uh, Every, uh, uh, what can governments do? What can individuals do? What can the community do? Right? What are some constructive ways that we as protagonists can contribute towards building capabilities? At the start of the session, we talked about those capabilities. So what can we do to contribute towards building capabilities to rebuild better? Um, let me start with Ethan. Um, sure. Um, so I think before even we think about these questions, right, I think one key question that we shall ask ourselves is, um, it's, so I'm trying to, let me, let me rephrase my, my thoughts. So, um, I think what one key question that we need to ask ourselves is what drive us to take actions? Um, are there any personal resistance which I would need to overcome first before, before I can take these actions? I think like questions that the groups have raised are very important questions. Um, thinking about what is the purpose of education, what kind of education that I want my children to experience and what kind of communities that we want to to build in the futures and, and backward plan from that process. I think, I, I trust that in, in dining tables or in our engagements with people, uh, there are a lot of this kind of conversations going on when we are seeing problems exist in, in our world, in our societies. But, but not many of us are actually taking that actions. So thus, I would like to challenge us to think as when we see these problems, uh, do we actually uh, taking any actions? If we are not taking any actions, uh, what is stopping us to take uh, that actions to, to build uh, ourselves, to build the people surrounding us, to, to rebuild these nations, to rebuild our communities? Um, so TFM's role in, in this movement of edu ending education inequities is bridging the gaps. So during this past months, um, the learnings that we have learned, looking into the challenges that our parents are struggling, juggling between works and also supporting the kids. The teachers, like what uh, Wiling had shared earlier, is that our teachers are not prepared and not familiar with this quick transitions from uh, in-classroom learning to online teachings. Um, even students, uh, not student, not many students are really motivated in joining online classes, and and to help all the dif different dis different group of stakeholders, what TFM has done is, uh, we have partnered with uh, private stakeholders to launch a micro site on um, how tos for different stakeholders, parents, students, teachers, and principals, to to face the pandemic. Um, we have partnered with YTL to create online content for teachers and parents to be able to teach their kids at home themselves. Um, knowing that some students from low income families do not have the access to technology. So we partner with HP to provide laptops to their students mm -hmm. so that they can connect with teachers and engage with on the classes. Uh, likewise, we are also supporting schools, uh, TFM schools in upskilling teachers on how to teach classes off 
online for those students coming from a low bandwidth using WhatsApp and Telegram, this kind of platforms. And currently, we are also in discussions to co-create learning boxes that will be sent to students who are still unable to return to schools, knowing that even though um, schools are every students are returning to schools on 15th of July, but not all schools are operating in Model 1, uh, single session school, Model 2, dual session schools and model trees. So some schools, some huge schools will still need to go to model trees where uh, blended learnings are happening. Mm. So, so yeah. yeah, thank you. Perfect, perfect. Um, I, I, I love how you took that idea of the dining table and uh, you, you're talking about how what, what conversations take place? Again, I hope that everyone goes back and I hope your dinner conversations on table with your families will really be quite different today uh, if they have not already been uh, reflecting on questions that face society, right? And, uh, and you're talking about how are, we, how are we translating that to lines of action? Again, back to protagonists, right? All of us are protagonists in this whole, the way we shape whichever society that... Uh, within our circle of influence and uh, how we're doing that constructively. There are ways, there are ways to take action and there are ways to take action, right? So how are we doing it constructively to build a uh, rebuild community? Uh, kudos to TFM for your wonderful efforts. I want to say that you are, uh, TFM is exemplary of reaching the furthest first. Reaching the furthest first is the SDGs which if you don't know the SDGs are the sustainable development goals, which is our global framework for action. The SDGs say that the tagline is leave no one behind. That's the aim. And how can you do that? Reach the furthest first, not those nearest first. And the TFM kudos to a, a lot of your creative efforts uh, for alternative learning. Uh, let me go to uh, Wailing now. On, so it takes a village to raise a child, Wailing. You know that already and you preach that. So what are some of the constructive ways we as protagonists can contribute towards building capabilities to rebuild better? Go ahead. Yeah, I truly love that phrase. Um, it takes a village. And, um, but you see, we are, the villages, where have they all gone to, right? But uh, the thing is, with the past 20 years, um, uh, we've used the technology to build communities online and uh, we have succeeded uh, fairly well uh, through um, the early years uh, a, a government grant given to family place and that was helpful in us uh, uh, enforcing that and uh, we have reached out to lots of families online and then we organize face-to-face uh, -face meetings so now is 20 years after and we have in this situation where the internet actually facilitate this kind of connections. So we have to continually build communities. And, uh, and from there, we also have to recognize, recognize the natural uh, different abilities of each individual, see? So I always say that you do not, um, you know, when you start teaching somebody, you do not think that they are empty vessels to be filled. They aren't. They have very beautiful things already, but they are not acknowledged. They're not because they're, these some of uh, these qualities uh, they're not considered important, you know, in society. Mm -hmm. So, but then what are the important qualities? Mm -hmm. So this like all this academic knowledge, you need to internalize them. If it's just academic, in theory, it's not really doing you any good. So it's the same approach as you uh, learn to be more spiritual. You see, you don't just read the words from the Bible or the Holy Book, but you need to internalize them. You understand and reflect, and then the, uh, the enlightenment will come. Yeah, it's, it's the same thing. Education is not different when it comes to uh, educating more uh, vast people and the masses. Yeah, but the, the problem is lies when we fail to recognize each individual because there's so many kids in the class. Yeah, 
So it's easier to just boom, everybody learns the same thing. So my, when we educate our children, we will know each parent who has more than one child will know that each child is so different. We all have unique strengths as well as weaknesses. So what um, I think this year is, it's not just um, my child, my daughter reminded me yesterday that not everything is um, perfect and beautiful. You see, everyone has their struggles. Yeah, even though I have been advocating for medication, it doesn't mean everything is perfect. No, the struggles, day-to-day -day living, they're real. It's just that we manage to have um, more, more or less more control over the choices that we make. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, not so much... Um, uh, what do you call it, influenced by outside opinion and all. So that is important and for ourselves as well for our children. That's why they, whatever that they choose, they think through, reflect, we discuss. So communication and also I like the, just now um, the speaker says that uh, you need to give them the vocabulary to express themselves. So yeah. expressing in all forms needs to be encouraged. That's why uh, Ken Robinson always emphasized the arts education. You cannot neglect it. Right. Yeah? So these are the changes we need to have. But because it's resistant, when a, an institution is resistant to change, it's very difficult to change from the top. The top is not proactive. Yeah. But we are all protagonists here. Mm -hmm. So we change from the bottom. And some people say, no, it never works. But I believe it does. Because we have the internet now. And yeah. you can spread it far and wide. Yeah, well said. It's, um, yeah. Well said, well said. I, um, so I, I like the way you, you went head on and said, oh, villages? Now, where are the villages, right? Where are the people? Uh, our, you know, the saying that it takes a village to raise a child, we need to see all ourselves. Uh, and, and who are these children? Only our children? Neighbors' children? Or children in general. I like the way you focused on recognizing the, the growth and capacity of each individual, each individual learner. And uh, they don't have to be in the space of school, right? Because learning takes place everywhere. So what is the role of even parents, as you're saying, in recognizing that growth of the individual and what does the parent have to do? So we, in, in essence, taking, looking at village, we're looking at each of us, all of us as uh, educators. Lily, what are your thoughts, Lily? Well, um, basically, I, when I saw the African proverb, it takes a village to raise a child, it came to me that, yeah, so that later the village as well as other villagers can thrive. The reason why we invest in, the, in a child is because they are our future. And we cannot project a future of a world based on the model that we know. We are, we are educated in a time and space where it's very different from them. Like, for example, okay, I'm, I do, I'm giving myself as an example. I was a very academically inclined person. But uh, out of my five kids, two of them are not. And, and, and because they were in public school, practically nothing, went, nothing happened during the MCO period. So one day I asked my kid, what are you doing? I'm doing a collab, mom. But that was the first time I heard the word collab. What's a collab? <laughs> and then after teaching me what a collab is, she was actually uh, uh, collaborating with her peers in developing a video for their YouTube channel. So this is something that for me is new. Although I say, okay, wow. So what do you do? Okay, we have to do the video editing, we have to do this. And these are all the skills that they are, they are employing without their teacher. They're actually learning it themselves. They didn't have their classes, but they were doing something. Kids are always curious. They're always learning. And what we see as, oh, you're just doing videos, is something that they're learning. So we cannot project our model of a world based on how we understand it to our, our children, our new generation. They have their own model in their head already. So as parents, 
despite our kids being very different from us, we need to be engaged and we need to support. Mm -hmm. And because now there's a, the new trend of the gig economies, the e-economies, the digital uh, world and, and whatnot, I mean, I asked my kid, what, what do you want to do? Oh, I'm, I'm going to work in a studio and I'm going to open, uh, I'm going to be a YouTube uh, 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 channel. I'm going to be a YouTube influencer. And her, her idea of sources of income is varied. For us, we've only known, okay, either you are self-employed or you're employed. But for them, they are actually going into multiple sources of income. But that's how the world is changing and it will continue to change. That's what parents should do, encourage and support. Schools should focus more on holistic development rather than just academics. Mm. Holistic means whole. And policymakers and government reform. Society as well, we evaluate what we, what we want, we evaluate our priorities, stop stereotyping. Like Gen X's, uh, the, uh, we, we like to call the Gen X's the entitled generation. The Gen Z's, the snowflake generation, that should all stop. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, thank you. Um, I think you said it all. I'm not going to summarize it. Again, uh, a lot more focus on, on the parents. Uh, I'm very cognizant of the time. I just want to tell the audience that uh, we are really coming to the close of the program. And so uh, do stay on because I'm going to ask you all a question in a bit. Can we hear from uh, Gregory, please? Yeah, sure. Uh, I mean, this phrase, it takes a village uh, to raise a child. To me, I feel that um, uh, like the other panelists were saying that, you know, that education should start from, from the heart, from the family. Yes, and uh, once you start from the family, and then it should actually go to the neighbours and to, to, to the community. Yeah, so that, the, like the fruits that, you know, the tree that we want to plant, you know, you put nutrient and all, and then the, the fruits that you want to bear, that fruit should be the fruit that can be enjoyed not by just ourselves, but it should be the fruit that can be enjoyed by everybody in the society. So I think we, we all of us, I mean, the community should understand that the children are the future. The children are the, are the future that, 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 uh, that will, will be, you know, managing the world. So, so if, if that thought can be there and everybody take ownership and invest in them, not just the parents invest in the education, but the whole community. So, and if we have that in mind, so everybody can play their role. So, I mean, we can be, we can be teaching our kids to be, to be compassionate at home and all sorts of things. But when we go outside the house, you know, when we see our neighbors, we don't even greet them. We don't even smile at them. We don't even know them. So, so I feel that, the community, like uh, the whole entire village should play a role. So we have, means the, the child itself should, should not learn only from the house, but it should be, you know, uh, after learning and it should be applied outside the house and in the community and every, uh, everyone in the community should be playing a role. That means, uh, the, you know, the neighbors should, should be, you know, should be more uh, friendly, should, you know, the teachers should, should think about how how the children, uh, the education system can, can actually uh, encourage children to be more service oriented to their neighbors and to their community around them. So yeah. that's what I feel about uh, this phrase that why it takes a village to raise a child. Thank you, thank you. Well said, well said. Um, you're talking about the role of the family, the neighbors, the community. Um, I, I liked what you talked about, that how should we look about, our, think about our role, even, uh, even, if, even if it's with children or even with each other, uh, people we, we are not related to. And I'm just thinking of the simplest thing that everyone can do in a public space is to model the right behavior. You know, so I think that, that you can even begin with that. How can we be more conscious uh, about modeling the right behavior? And, and thank you so much for that. And thank you, panelists. I mean, you addressed these questions in such a punchy, rapid fire way. And congratulations uh, to all of you. And uh, we, I can't get the audience to clap, so I'm going to clap for you. Well done.